Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Easy Equities webinar with CoreShares. I'm your host today, Sean Keeling, and today we are joined by Zizi Pope, who is an investment and research analyst at CoreShares Asset Management. Zippo will be chatting to us today about what is an index and unpacking the definition of an index and working through some examples to help us understand everything. So by the end of the session, you should understand the link between ETFs and NISAs, and as well as the importance of our diversification of investments. So thanks so much for joining us today, Zippo. And thank you to all of you for taking your time out of your day to join us again. Um, I hope you're all keeping safe uh, in this time and enjoying a bit more freedom. Um, just a reminder, if you're looking for more information around ETFs, please check out our Easy ETFs platform at easyetfs.com, as well as if you're looking for a recording of this webinar afterwards, it'll be on our webinar page uh, on Easy ETFs um, also. Um, you can also register for upcoming webinars on, on that page, and we have a few more webinars with CoreShares coming up over the next few months, so make sure to check it out on that page. And before I start, I just want to see if everyone can hear me. Can you please just raise your digital hands if you can hear, hear me? Okay, thanks everyone. I see a few hands. And uh, also, please just ask, some, uh, ask questions as we go in the question box. Um, after the Zippo's presentation, we'll also be joined for, by Chris Rule from CoreShares, and um, I will ask questions to them after the presentation. So, with enough ado, over to you, Zippo. Uh, thanks, Sean. Good morning, all. A uh, very big thank you to Sean and to Easy Equities for having us today. Uh, like you mentioned, my name is Zizi Paul Baye. I'm a research and investment analyst at CoreShares, and we are an asset management company that offers index tracking ETFs as well as unit trusts. And we offer a quite a broad suite of equity strategies as well as some multi-asset funds as well. And today we'll just be chatting through indices, they are linked to ETFs, the benefits of index tracking ETFs, as well as go through a very brief introduction into one of the CoreShares flagship ETFs. So this is going to be just a 10 to 15 minute presentation, but we would like for it to be more of a discussion. So please feel free to ask questions along the way in the chat, and then we will have designated time for questions at the end. So many of us would have heard expressions like the Dow is up 100 points this week or the S&P is down 50 points. But what exactly does this mean? The Dow Jones and the S&P 500 are both examples of what we call a stock market index. And an index is basically a basket of shares that are grouped together to measure the value and performance of a market. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, established in 1896 by financial reporter Charles Dow, is often cited as one of the very first indices. It was established as simply a benchmark to which we could compare the blue chip companies of the day. And it provided a snapshot of how individual companies were performing against their peer average. And finally, it also helped the investors like you and I better understand the market as a whole. Now, how are these indices constructed? Let's take South African listed companies, i.e. companies that are listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange as our starting universe. If we wanted to create an index of two of the largest companies in the JSE and call this index, say, the JSE Top 2 Index, the most simple methodology in creating such an index would be through market cap weighting where market cap is simply the number of shares a company has an issue multiplied by its share price. And market cap is used as an indication of size of a company. Once we've established each company's market cap, we can then, we can then hold them proportionally based on their size. So if the two largest companies, for example, in the JSC were Nasbus and Richmond, and they each had a market cap of 20 Rand and 10 Rand respectively, we see that the total value of that index would be 30 Rand, and thus NASPAS would have a 67% weighting and Richmond would have a 33% weighting in the index. This difference in weighting also means that changes in NASPAS's performance or share price will have a much greater effect on the index as compared to changes in Richmond. 
Now, of course, Indices are barely ever made up of just two companies. They tend to be much more complex than that. And two very common indices, which a lot of us might be familiar with, is the S&P 500 index, as well as the JSE Top 40 index. The S&P 500 tracks the performance of the 500 largest publicly traded companies in the, in the United States. And it is often used to provide an overall picture of what the stock market looks like and what its performance is like. And some common constituents of this index include companies that we have all kind of seen, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, et cetera. Similarly, the JSE Top 40 Index tracks the 40 largest companies on, in South Africa by market cap. And this index provides an overall picture of the South African stock market and represents more than 80% of the value of the companies that are listed on the JSE. Some popular constituents here would be companies like NASFAS, Vodacom, AD InBev, BHP. Both these indices are market cap weighted. And this means that larger companies will have a greater weighting in the index than the smaller companies. Although indices have been around for since the 19th century, they've only really gained popularity in the last two or so decades mainly due to two reasons. Firstly, the emergence of ETFs, which are basically just in investment funds that are traded on a stock exchange, as well as the wider adoption of passive investment strategies. And this came about due to investors beginning to question the fees they were paying on the investments and the fact that it became more and more difficult to know and pick which blue, blue chip stocks would be the ones that would outperform the market. It became more and more attractive to rather invest in the market itself. So we've established that indices allow us as investors to compare our investments against the market. But over the last two to three decades, asset managers have began creating funds or, or portfolios that mimic or track these indices by going and buying the underlying stock that make up the index at the exact same weight as that of the index essentially then allowing you and I as everyday investors to invest in the index as well. These funds are commonly known as index tracking ETFs or index tracking unit trusts. And these funds allow the average investor to invest in an extended range of companies without needing to buy each company's stock individually. So for example, the CoreShares S&P 500 ETF allows average investors to invest in 500 of the largest US-based companies without having to eventually buy Microsoft stocks, Apple stocks, Facebook stocks, et cetera. Index tracking ETFs offer diversification, of which diversification is something we truly want in our investments. Essentially, it is really the only free lunch in investing, and it offers it at lower prices. Index tracking ETFs are what we also know as passive investing. Now, CoreShares offers a range of index tracking ETFs, and one of our flagship ETFs is the CoreShares Top 50. This fund tracks the S&P SA Top 50 index and consists of South Africa's top 50 largest companies by free float adjusted market cap. The SWIX Top 40 was the, one of the very first um, index tracking ETFs in South Africa, but it did come with its challenges. And one of those challenges was the concentration of bigger companies because it was simply market cap weighted. We have since introduced the Top 50 um, index tracking ETF. And what makes the Top 50 fund unique from similar strategies like the Top 40 is that it applies a 10% smart cap. And this basically means that there's no stock that will have a weight greater than 10% in the fund. Because the South African stock market tends to be quite concentrated, by capping each company at 10%, we're able to improve risk by spreading investment exposure across other companies and thus, and thus at the same time also improving diversification. This bears testament of how indices have evolved over time. They are no longer what they essentially used to be, which was purely market cap weighted indices. Similar competing strategies 
um, similar competing strategies often track the top 40. So by including the additional 10 companies in our top 50, we provide a greater level of diversification and offer access to more mid-cap type companies. Capping each company at 10% is exceptionally important as it decreases the concentration within the fund. Concentration usually possesses additional risk, thus the 10% cap offers an extra layer of risk management without giving up the upside. In this graph, for example, we can see that the performance of the smart cap top 50 is very similar to that of the SWIFT top 40 over a 14-year period, yet it still offers lower levels of risk. This graph here compares CoreShares Top 50 ETF to the S&P uh, Top 50 index, which it tracks. And we can see from the performance of our Top 50, and we can see from the performance that our Top 50 very closely tracks the index. It holds the underlying shares of the index and tracks it very precisely. Thus, by investing in the Top 50 ETF, you are essentially investing in the actual market you're particularly investing in the S&P SA Top 50 Index. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Sipo. That was really a kind of nice little brief one into what indexes are and into the cautious Top 50. So thanks so much for sharing that with us. Um, well, I see that, um, please, please put some questions in the question box if, if you have any questions about the presentation or anything that you would like to ask cautious. I have uh, just one or two just before we get to um, those ones. Um, you guys spoke about tracking indexes and that, and I just wanted to just find out a little bit more about um, the cost behind how you pick indexes and, and how you work it out into the, the total expense ratio of the ETFs. So I don't know. If, you and Chris can, can help you just understand that a little bit more. Sean, could you just just so I'm clear, you said you wanted to understand um, the, 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 the impact of the cost of how we pick shares and put them into the um, portfolio and how that impacts on the TER. Is that correct? Yeah, with, with tracking the certain indexes that you pick. I just wanted to find out the, how, how you pick indexes on their cost and, and put that into portfolio, your portfolios and that. Sure. So, uh, I mean, it's a good question. There's there's actually a lot of detail that happens behind the scenes, even even though they're you know really simple instruments. The top 50 is super simple. It's 50 largest shares. You just give your money to core shares and, and off you go. So the costs that are that are involved with that, um, as as an investor, you pay the management fee. Now that that absorbs pretty much all the costs that. Um, that core shares uh, takes on in terms of tracking the index. So, for example, the top 50 tracks an S&P index, the S&P top 50. Um, you know, we pay S&P royalties essentially to track that index. So, in your management fee is an index tracking fee. So, that's the very obvious cost associated with index tracking ETFs. It also takes into account the cost of managing the actual fund. The the so so the TER includes includes that. It also includes other costs, Sean, such as audit fees and bank charges, custody fees. So in an ETF, your assets are held in custody with a third party. So, so you know they, they are protected and, and ring fenced from from core shares um, and, and so forth. So there are a number of costs that come into the TER. The actual trading uh, of the of the underlying shares comes into another measure, and, and that's called the TIC. Now, the TIC takes into account transaction costs. So buying and selling of underlying shares is a, is a transaction cost fee associated with that. Now, that, that, that cost comes in over and above the TR. So as an example, on our top 50 ETF, the TR is 26 basis points, and the and the TIC is 29. So essentially three basis points or 0.03% um, is the cost associated with trading the underlying shares. Now, now that, that's because we rebalance the index on a quarterly basis. And of course, money comes in and out of the portfolio. So 
if you contextualize that relative to an individual um, on the Easy Equities platform, your your T your transaction cost is essentially uh, 0.25%. Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, or 25 basis points. So how how are we able to get those costs so low? Um, it's because we're transacting in such you know large quantities in, in bulk. So you know when we're trading. Um, even though Easy Equities is, you know, by far the, the cheapest uh, platform for individuals, um, for DIY investors, when it gets into the institutional world, when it gets into the world of asset managers, you know, we're trading at a fraction of what of what clients on Easy Equities are trading because we're doing such big volumes. You know, we're trading billions of rands every year. Um, so, so that kind of gives you an idea of all the different cost breakdowns. Sean, I, I don't know if I answered your question nicely. Oh, that's perfect. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, makes, it, makes a lot more sense. So thanks for that. Um, we have a few questions here, so I'm just going to get to them. And guys, please, I'll set them all in the question box if you have anything to ask the team. Um, to the Corsairs team, briefly, what would you say is the difference between an ETF and an index? So, um, ZZ, jump in if you want to. If you want to elaborate. The difference between an ETF and an index is is quite is you know quite straightforward actually. Um, <clears throat> they're very closely associated though, so that's where the confusion comes in. Um, as Zizi kind of laid out in her presentation, indices were designed as a way to measure a market. So actually, what an index is is a theoretical market portfolio. In other words. It's it's just a you know it's it's a theoretical measure of the market movement and and how they how they kind of get to their calculation in most instances is by using the size of a company so you know the largest company gets the largest weight um, because that represents what exists in the market so you know an index is theoretical what an ETF is is a real investment opportunity as an investor you can't actually invest in an index you can't phone up uh, S&P and say, I want to invest in one of your indices. They can't offer that to you. But what you can do is find out which ETFs track those indices mm -hmm. and then phone up that asset manager and invest into an ETF. So, um, you know, the difference is, is that an ETF is, in, is, is investable for, for all investors. And what the ETF providers do is they actually buy the intellectual property or the rights to that index from the index provider. Um, so let's say the S&P 500, for example, CoreShares actually has a contract with S&P. We buy the rights to that index, and on a daily basis, we get the portfolio or the index um, weights of all the different shares, and we physically go and buy the underlying shares and hold them in a fund for you. So really, the difference is, you know, an index is a theoretical market barometer. You could see it like that, whereas an ETF um, tracks an index and, and, and is a real investment opportunity for investors. Thanks, Chris. We have another one for the team here saying, why do some people seem to think that indexation works as well in South African markets as it does in offshore markets? Sean, could you repeat that? You broke up a little bit on our side. Apologies. No worries. Sorry. Why do some people seem to think that indexation doesn't work as well in South African markets as it does in offshore markets? Sean, I didn't quite understand that question. So, sorry, can, can you give it another go? Apologies. No worries. Why do some people seem to think that indexation doesn't work as well in South African markets as it does in offshore markets? Thanks. I, th I thought you were saying inflation, not indexation. That's why I was <laughs> struggling no to understand. So, Sean, yeah, I'm going to scroll around here a little bit. I mean, the, the, the key critique to why, okay, I mean, I would, first of all, whoever asked that question, I'd really encourage you to go and watch our last webinar with Easy Equities because we go into quite a lot of detail in terms of the benefits of indexation, like the, the, the you know the hard benefits. But I'm going to answer it um, any in any instance. First of all, um, if you look at that that comment, indexation works better offshore than it does in South Africa. What is it premised on? So typically, it's premised on two kind of key critiques. The one is that it's easier to outperform the South African index. So, so that's the one, is a performance thing. Right? So in, in South Africa, it's much easier because it's a small universe. 
you, you know which shares to pick. You know, you can just pick Sasol or you can pick Nas person, you're gonna outperform the index. So that's the one thing. The other thing is best is a diversification uh, argument. And and that's kind of more of a, um, you know, our market because it's smaller and less uh, diverse, um, you know, you don't get the same diversification benefits of, of, of say the US market where you've got 500 shares and your largest share is is five percent in Microsoft, as, just as an example. So I'm going to tackle um, the performance question first. Now the reason why I'm tackling that fir that first is because it is quite simply an incorrect statement. And why I can say it with so much confidence is because we've literally got statistics and we've got hard numbers that can dispute that kind of argument. That you know, in South Africa, it's easy to outperform the index. In fact, if you look at the percentage of professional investors who outperform the South African index over multiple periods, so you know over uh, you know every five-year period over the last from 2014, um, what we find is that actually fewer investors outperform the South African index um, than they do in the U.S. market, as an example. So you know, and and that's kind of the some of the research I was referring to from our previous webinars, where we've actually got the hard numbers up on the screen and and that's really easy to debunk because uh, you know it's hard stats it's 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 performance numbers it's it's there in the open these are all public numbers so you know that that kind of um you know uh, i'm trying to think what the word is but you know almost um misnomer that south africa in south africa it's easy to outperform the index is, is quite simply not true around 90 percent of uh, of active professional fund managers have underperformed the market over the last year or so. So, you know, it, it's it's uh, over the last five years. So it's just simply not true. On the diversification argument, that argument tends to have more merit. And the reason why it has more merit is because it's a really, again, a really easy thing to measure. So how can you measure diversification? Well, you can see it in two ways. You can see, well, how many shares are in the portfolio? So take the S&P 500 as an example. Um, there are 500 shares in that portfolio. So, wow, that's really diverse. You know, you buy one ETF and you get exposure to 500 shares. So, that's one way. Um, the other way of looking at diversification is how much exposure do you have to one share? And again, that's quite easy to measure. If you look at the S&P 500, you know, even though the tech shares are dominating at the top 10, the largest shares, somewhere between 4 and 5% of your portfolio. So, you don't have more than 5%, let's say, exposure to one individual share. Now, when you contrast that with the South African market, let's take the top 40 as an example. How many shares do you have? Well, you've only got 40. So, you know, you're already far fewer shares than the S&P 500. And then if you look at that largest share weight of close to 22%, that's why I'm putting this up on the screen. Um, you know, that's a fair critique to say, is it reasonable as an investor to have 22% of your portfolio in one share. Um, so, so we actually think that that's a fairly reasonable critique um, and is, is a lot, to a large extent the reason why when, when looking at uh, you know, our SA equity, our simple SA equity, we applied a cap of 10% to an individual share. Um, and, and, and that's to manage that risk. Once you do that, you kind of debunk a lot of that kind of criticism because what you find is that you can have a far more diverse portfolio just by capping a single share at 10, and then and then you know let's you know stretching the tail out to 50. It's worth noting that in these market cap weighted indices, when you get to the tail, and when I'm talking about the tail, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but on the on the right hand side of this graph, you see the shares get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's that is the same in in the S&P 500 or the MSCI world. The same could be said. So even though you own 500 shares effectively most of your exposure sits in the top half of this index. So, you know, that is common throughout all markets. So, yeah, the, the critique around performance is quite simply inaccurate and, and, and incorrect. The critique around diversification has some merit, um, but it's fair to say that index design has evolved and, and things like single stock caps, et cetera, um, actually um, improve that kind of uh, measure and, and therefore debunk that critique. The other critique that hangs around a lot is that when markets crash, it's just so easy to outperform these indices because you can manage for risk. So, you know, it's just really easy. We actually wrote an article on this um, during the crash in March and April where we showed that, uh, and, and S&P has also recently released the numbers, some 73 odd percent of active managers 
who's let's call it one of their primary or one of their key value propositions is risk management, actually underperformed a simple index like the top 50 in the crash. And even more underperformed the top 40, by the way. So, you know, that again, when you look at the hard numbers, it's really hard to, to find criticism uh, for, for, for indices in both South Africa um, and, and uh, uh, you know, abroad. We actually did a paper a while back on debunking some of these myths, and it's also on our website. Um, we'll, we'll be happy to share it with you if you just drop us an email or send Sean a message and we can share it with him. But it's all there on our kind of research portion of our paper, of our website, apologies. Thanks a lot, Chris. That was a, that was a really good answer. One of your better ones yet. Um, so thanks for that. Also, there was another question speaking about active and passive management. So you touched on all of that also. So, so thanks for that. Guys, um, please, please hit some questions in the question box. Um, we'll give you a few time to do that. Um, but while we're waiting for more to come in, um, Zippo, you touched on earlier talking about tracking error um, of indexes. And then I wonder if you can just elaborate more on, more on that while we wait for, for guys to put in um, some more questions. So Sean, on, on tracking error, um, this slide that I've pulled up here um, talks to, to, to the tracking error. Um, and, and really um, what it is, and, 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 and I'm going to kind of elaborate a bit here, but there's a, it's a statistical measure, right? It, what it really says is, is how, how the performance of an ETF um, could vary from the index. Now, that's kind of the... The statistical, when in, in the world of asset management, when we talk about tracking error, that's what we're talking about. So this shows you how the index moves next to the fund. What most people think of when they're thinking of tracking error is by how much does an ETF underperform its index. So if the index did 20% in a year, you know what return did the um, in, you know the, the ETF actually return, and was it 20% or was it 19.5 or was it 19? That's that return difference is what the market commonly talks about as tracking error. Now, um, you know, tracking error, the statistical measure is, 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 is quite complex. So I'm going to leave that behind. As a basic rule of thumb, if a manager is good at tracking, you can take their tracking uh, difference or tracking error to be the index return minus their TIC. So if the, if the index did 20% in a year, you're going to get 20% minus in the case of like the top 50 ETF, 0.29%. So your return is going to be roughly 19.7%. Now that's that's a very basic rule of thumb, but I think it's a fair um, assumption. There are instances where you can be very bad at tracking. In other words, you don't hold the shares in exactly the same weight as the index, and then you can get some return variance. So you might either return above the index actually just by pure luck um, or, or below the index. Um, but, you know, most of the ETF providers in the market are actually really good at tracking. This fund, for example, the, the top 50, with, with this tracking here, you, it almost looks like one line where there's the index and the ETF. You know, a year ago, this fund won the Salter Award for the tightest tracking relative to the index over a three-year period. Um, and, 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 you know, it's, it's fair to say that that difference between that fund and the, 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 the ETFs that came second and third and fourth is extremely marginal that you know they're really all good at tracking so it's something to watch out for but the big driver in terms of return difference is the cost so you know if, you, if you're really interested in look at the costs on a forward looking basis of course on a backward looking basis all fact sheets must show both the index return and the fund return so you actually are able to see historically how that fund has has performed relative to its to its index Right, thanks a lot, Chris. Um, we don't have any other questions at the moment. So I'll just have one more quick question and then um, then we, we'll, we'll see if there's more after that. Um, so you guys have a variety of funds and a variety of funds that track indexes. Are you looking at any other going forward that you would like to add to them? Um, and if so, what indexes are you looking, are you looking at um, potentially? Yeah, so I mean, Short answer is, Sean, we're always looking at opportunities for new ETFs, for new exposures that that clients are, are, are interested in. Um, the, the sweet spot, if you think about it in ETFs, is, is matching up investor demand with the product. So, you know, if we look at 
to the market, you know, where where is the demand? So it's fair to say at the, at the current stage, if you look at the whole ETF market, we're fairly well covered in South Africa, especially compared to five years ago, you know, when when there was, you know, half the amount of ETFs. So you can buy country exposure, you know, you can buy thematic exposure on our markets, you can buy bonds, global bonds, uh, you know, there, there, there's a lot of exposure that's out there. The core shares as a business, we always want to bring in new and exciting exposure to the market. So we don't, you know, just want to do a, a, another fund because, you know, we, we kind of can. So yeah, we're looking at new opportunities, Sean. I mean, in the in the kind of uh, DIY investor, retail investor space, there's a lot of excitement around thematic investors investing. So, looking at big global trends, uh, the Internet of Things, uh, technology, biotechnology, automation and robotics. You know, these are big, exciting themes globally. The question is, how do we package it up and make it exciting for local investors, as well as being a, a good investment proposition? So that's you know, as a business, we always want to bring something that's super robust um, and well designed from an investment proposition. We don't just want to, you know, bring the, the, the next ETF that's a fad, you know, that, that's going to last for six months. We want our ETFs to be in the market in 20 years time. So that's that, that's the challenge is, is putting together, you know, a robust framework around that. Um, there are exposures on our market um, that we just don't have yet. Um, so we're looking at those gaps at the moment, um, and 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 there's some there's some exciting opportunities on the boil, and hopefully we can talk to you guys about them in early next year. But yeah, it's fair to say there's there's a lot going on behind the scenes. I think it's fair to say across all the ETF providers there's a lot going on behind the scenes. But certainly at CoreShares we're hoping to bring some exciting new stuff to the market um, in the next in the next uh, uh, six months or so. Nicely, I explain how it's a balance between something that's sustainable and for long term, and that's uh, what people want at the moment. So, interesting yeah, to see what. what's really important for us at CoreShares is that, you know, when we launch an ETF, it's got a sustainable investment philosophy, and what underpins it is is great investment thinking, as opposed to, you know, the hot the hot idea of the day. You know, it needs to be a 10, 20 year play. Um, and, and that's how we like to think about the world of investing. 100%, and that's, I think, that is, it's a long-term investment, if you're looking at a TFSA or, or something like that, so that's really good to hear also. Um, so we have one or two questions coming up at the bottom here, so I'll pass them to you guys. How long have uh, ETFs been available per, for purchase on the market? I know in South Africa, the first ETF was launched in 2000, and um, but overseas and in the US and that, when were the first ETFs uh, available on the market? So Sean, you're quite right. The first um, the first ETF in the South African market um, uh, it was the Satrix 40, and that that existed um, um, in um, uh, well, actually, it's interesting. The Satrix 40 launched as as an ETF, but not as a collective investment scheme, and which is a unit trust, it's subsequently changed to a CIS, which most ETFs are. Um, globally, the first um, ETF was in the 1970s. Well, it was actually an index tracking fund based on the S&P 500. It wasn't an ETF per se. Um, and, 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 and that was known as Bogle's Folly. And it was called Bogle's Folly because Jack Bogle, who's the founder of Vanguard, you know, had this big idea of index tracking at, in the 70s no one actually tracked indices they just used it as a market barometer and and he launched this fund with all this hurrah and, and excitement and no one invested in the s p 500 when it first launched it, it was a called as folly because it was a massive failure it, it didn't raise the assets and the the excitement um that it, that it was that it was thought to have done um i'm just i'm actually uh, I, I have a confession i'm googling the, the first ETF that launched globally um, was a State Street ETF. State Street's a U.S. ETF um, business. Um, I just want to find the exact um, date. Um, I think it was in the 90s, but 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 if you give me the one second, um, I should be able to give you the exact number. Uh, 1989 was the first ETF launched in the U.S. 
So, you know, they haven't been around for a very long period of time. Where you've seen the huge rise in ETFs is, is based on the low cost. So what people are calling the democratization of investing, where as an individual, you know, um, with 100 Rand, you can buy a top 50 mandate at 20 basis points. Now, you know, that's very cost effective. If you go to an active manager, you're probably paying 150. So you're paying close to eight times that to, to get an investment uh, portfolio. Um, so, so you, you know, the cost angle has driven flows to ETFs. Of course, this whole, you know, research-based approach to investing that's becoming more and more, you know, rigorous and less and less speculative, where investors are starting to work out that actually what drives long-term return success is low costs. I'm sure Easy Equities would have a lot to say about that being a low-cost uh, investment platform. Um, so, you know, that that kind of knowledge that investors are armed with now that costs drive a huge part of your investment outcome. So to be in low cost ETFs is extremely important. And then the transparency behind it, you know, there are no funnies. You, you're investing in a, a fund that owns the physical shares. There's no derivatives. There's no like single, you know, individual risk. There's, there's a lot of rigor behind the structure. And through the global financial crisis where we saw, you know, markets crashing and funds crashing because they were small cap funds or because they were leveraged or because they had too much exposure to the property market or, 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 or the, you know, you know, the different various parts of that market and the structuring behind it, the investment banking type structuring, you know, has seen investors moving away from uh, these super opaque and complex structures to the simplicity of ETFs. And I think that's what's driven all the interest in, in ETFs. Um, in, in, in recent history. In fact, the, the first ETF that was launched, uh, I spoke about it um, from State Street, was actually mostly used as an alternative to futures. So where big funds were getting exposure to futures to equitize a cash position very quickly, um, they started using ETFs. So they started saying, actually, we can get exposure to the market extremely quickly by just buying these ETFs. So, you know, the, 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 the ETF market has since obviously evolved and, and really has boomed um, uh, globally uh, in South Africa, less so, but we're certainly starting to see the pickup um, in flows and, and people starting to recognize the benefits of, of um, you know, ETFs. Thanks, Chris and yeah, I think there's a, an amazing pickup in the market at the moment and it's very interesting to know that First one was only in '89, so and, and there's been massive traction across the world um, in ETFs. Um, good old Google at least helped us get that thing. So thanks, thanks for that. Um, we have one more, um, one more question here, and and that's saying um, if I'm new to investing, what else apart from tracking should I be check, should I check when choosing an ETF? So aside from tracking, another very good consideration is the actual cost of the fund. Um, so costs have been known to be one of the biggest determinants of a fund's future success. So it does not necessarily mean that the lower the cost, the better, but obviously that is quite an important consideration in addition to the actual tracking of the, of the fund. So if you're trying to choose, for example, between different um, high equity um, strategies or like large cap strategies, and you're trying to choose which ETF from which manager to, to purchase, try to compare what their tracking error is compared to their costs. That would be quite a good place, good place to start. Yeah, 100% is easy. I mean, if I can add to that a kind of more of a holistic um, financial planning angle as opposed to just raw investing is you need to understand what your investment goals are. You know, that's how you actually select an ETF in the first place. So, you know, how do you choose the ETF that is appropriate for your goal? So if you've got a 20-year goal, you know, you can be in equities, but if you've got a one-year goal, you need to be in cash and bonds. Um, so that's the first kind of place to start is understand what your investment goals are, what your time horizons are, what your risk appetite is, work out which ETFs are appropriate. And then once you've done that, absolutely, then you look at the detail of the costs and the tracking error and all that stuff. But the first kind of port of call is understand your, what you're trying to achieve. And I think um, it's fair to say that that's often forgotten uh, when people approach the investing 
um, world, they, they just think, you know, I want to maximize return. So I'm just going to pick the cheapest ETF and off I go. But, but actually, you need to understand those goals and, and, and how you can achieve them. And, and what are the right kind of strategies? Is it South African equity, global equity, South African bonds, global bonds, property? You know, how do you mix them? How, it becomes very nuanced at that level. Um, but at a fund level, as Zizi said, you know, cost a good place to look at, risk management stuff. So, you know, do you feel comfortable in a fund? Um, but it, but it, 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 it is, there's a lot to look at. Um, so, you know, you, you, you must do your homework and, and feel free to reach out to businesses, you know, to help you along the way as well. Thanks, thanks so much for that answer, both of you guys. Is there just a question you're asking um, if the session is recorded. The session is recorded and it will be emailed to you tomorrow as well as if you are looking for a recording of, of the, this uh, webinar as well as past course shared webinars and other ones. It is um, on our Easy ETF site under the Learn tab. You'll find a webinar one and you can go in there and find all the recordings. Um, and we just have, sorry, there's one more question that's just come through. I think we'll do this one and then we'll call it there. It's, uh, it's asking, uh, it's, I'm not clear on how does one how one goes about selecting an ETF. Can you help me elaborate? Can you kindly elaborate, please? So Sean, I think the end part of that last question is 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 where you want to start. You know, you want to start with what your investment goal is, um, and then from there understand what your uh, you know time horizon is, what your what your risk appetite is. You know what your what your uh, return expectations are, and then and then kind of from there you'll find yourself playing in different asset classes. Then when you get down to the asset classes, I'm just going to use South African equity as an example. You know if you've got no specific objective, um, one what and and you want to invest in equities, you know then look at the large caps, the top 40s and the top 50s as an example. And then look at costs for sure. Look at cost as a key driver. But let's say you're retired and you want a little bit of income, then have a look at the dividend ETFs that are out there. So, you know, is that going to help you in your retirement journey? You know, so so they, they, there's really, it becomes extremely nuanced. So unfortunately, we can't give you like a, a, an answer that's specific to, to you. Um, but, but it's fair to say that you've got to start at your investment goals. You've got to understand what you're trying to achieve. Um, and, and which ETFs are going to actually help you achieve those goals with, with a high level of, of, of probability, you know, with a, with a high chance, essentially. I totally agree. Thank, thanks, Chris. Um, I think we'll, we'll give it a wrap there. So thank, thanks so much, Ezepo, for your presentation. Um, that was great. And thanks for joining us, Chris, to help us answer some of the questions. And um, most of all, thank you to all of us for joining to, uh, us today. I hope you found the session enlightening. And, and learned a lot from it. So um, thanks again and have a wonderful day. Well, thanks. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for having us. Absolute pleasure.